So I met Andy Grimes uh, a couple of years ago at an F3N competition, uh, and I, I ended up being his caller. Um, but since then, I've actually had a few chat to him, a few chats to him over the years because he is a uh, sports and performance coach. So we're going to get to know Andy, and we're going to ask him a couple of questions. So, who are you, and how long have you been <laughs> in the hobby? Uh, my name is Andy, Andy Grimes. Um, I've probably been in the hobby. I started with cars as a kid. So I drove cars around, but I never really did any flying type stuff at all until I was probably late 20s, something like that. So it's probably going to be six or seven years I've been flying helis. Right. Um, very lightly in the start and then just got more and more into it as time's gone on, really. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I've not done a huge amount in the competition side of things, but um, I'm always keen to see how things evolve with new new evol evolutions in the machines and so on so yeah so what helis have you flown and what helis have you owned and Ooh. what are you flying at the so moment? i i started with a raptor 30 nitro yeah that was slow <laughs> yeah but it was great for you know learning on it was a really good platform for just beginner movements learning your orientations and hovering and all that kind of stuff so yeah great for that i've got fond memories of that um and then i think i went to T-Rex 600 Nitro and a 700 Nitro, yeah. which were both very good, really enjoyed those, very capable. I learned a lot on those machines, they were really, really good. Um, and then I went to Compass for a right. while, so right. I flew the 7HVs for a couple of years, uh, and they were brilliant, I absolutely loved those as well. Um, and then I went back to a period with the line again, 700 Electrics, just two of those, and I'm now flying the XL Power Spectre V2. Yeah. And I've got a couple of those as well. So, you know, it's just a, a really versatile platform now. Could you just compare what you had before to what you've got now. It's, it's mind-blowing, yeah. really, when you think 10 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> that's what yeah. we've got now. It's great. So, so what do you actually do in terms of uh, performance coaching? I mean, I know you run a blog, RC Heli Performance. Um, yeah. I mean, what sort of stuff do you actually end up doing and talking to clients? And what do you talk to them about? And so professionally, um, I am a extreme sports coach. So I specialize in areas where there's a lot of um, stress-related anxiety and performance anxiety type issues. Right. So people that, you know, they, they struggle with the pressure of an environment or they struggle with um, the, the, the environmental factors that are coming in to cause more stress than they would usually have, uh, all the way through to working with GB teams and and squads for uh, for sort of kayaking and things like that um, and also some of the climbing stuff as well so I've done that uh, yeah. working with them and it's it's very specialized individual type tasks quite often right um, but I've worked with juniors as well as adults so it's a it's a really versatile mixture of of requirements so right I guess when I contacted you a couple of years ago I was kind of desperate to improve um, to the point of I, I do anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, Where's the secret sauce? Yeah, what is, what is the yeah. secret sauce to improving? So if, if someone asks you that, what is, what is your reply? I mean, how do you attack this thing? It's, it's obviously a massive subject. So, you know, I could probably talk for hours on just one element of it. Um, but for many people, I think, if, you, if you're that kind of person and you're looking to improve, um, you need to sort of work out for yourself, is that a long-term goal or is it a short-term goal or is it lots of small ones to get to a big one? Um, and having an appropriate goal is, is a key part of being able to, to make progress and actually seeing you improve. Because quite often we see, especially in the heli community, we see pilots, you know, they're making steady improvements every year, yeah. but it's everyone's sort of slightly improving as well. So it, it can be sort of, shadowed by somebody else's massive improvement potentially right. and those people that are still making improvements they're almost kind of feel like they haven't made much of an improvement yeah. just because they're shadowed by a, another person that's made a massive or significant improvement right with right. what they're doing so i think as long as you're able to benchmark where you're at and yeah. that that comes down to external feedback so you watch me fly you would then feed back what your thoughts were about specific maneuvers or how the flight looked, symmetry, all those kind of things, yeah. uh, all the way through to me reviewing my own flight and thinking about, oh, was that as good as my last routine? Was that manoeuvre as, as precise as I needed it to be right. to improve? Um, and then working out where those areas are, weaknesses are, and then addressing that. 
Right. Because if you, if you don't address the weaknesses, they get worse. They don't get any better. They just become more and more of a problem and it becomes more and more of a hardship to come out of that. You yeah. hear people use the term crutch. I think I, I, think I saw it mentioned sometimes. in one of the RCHN episodes where they were talking about basically your weaknesses as a big dog, the equivalent of a big dog on a street that you avoid every day. Yeah, yeah you and fly never, around the problem. it never yeah, goes yeah, yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Right. Definitely. So, right, so you spoke about goals there for a bit. Um, so your daily practice, how would you attack daily practice? I mean, what, what I tend to do is on my way to the field, I'm already thinking about what manoeuvres I want to start, I want to work on. Okay. So, I mean, how, how, how do you attack a daily, daily practice? This is really specific. So I don't think there's a daily routine kind of type principle for me anyway. Um, and I would say it's a very individualised process. It's not going to be like I couldn't fly your routine and get the same benefits that you might, for example, in terms of a, like a warm up or right. a, a progression type flight. It's going to depend on what that person needs to work on. Uh, and what that um, what, is our conditions viable to you know for that kind of improvement as well you've got to take into account all of the factors that kind of you need the stars to align in the right position to potentially get that focused attention on that one area right um, but if you're looking at sort of just going through the course of a day I would say there needs to be a period of becoming connected with the model to start with just assessing how you're feeling on the day Right. Um, do a couple of flights of just whatever you want really just nice smooth don't push it too hard you know you're just trying to get a feel for things really and see if you you're feeling well connected with the model that day and if you're not don't feel like you need to push it because what that might do is start to build in bad practices right. um, that become more concreted and even harder to then readjust so if you fly um, at a field where the wind is always behind you all the time and you never address that flying with the wind in your face kind of an issue you'll find that you're never going to break through into total control of the maneuver because right. you haven't varied the the factors around it right the environment yeah and the environment plays a huge factor a huge factor a lot of people don't think about it so if you're flying in a public space if there's other pilots watching you if there's uh, wind direction problems if you haven't got your model set up quite right all of those factors will cause problems and allow improvement if they're aligned properly so what about the saturation i mean sometimes i mean i've heard it mentioned in the past where pilots go and they say you can't fly all day and basically the first <coughs> four to five flights of the day are the most mm. important you're going to learn the most yeah. and anything after that you're just it's it's a waste of time i mean how much truth is there in that very personal right. <laughs> it depends on you i think you know if you're talking about the average kind of heli pilot that's predominantly kind of doing advanced sport flying a bit of 3d that kind of thing um they're probably not used to putting in 20 flights a day yeah. multiple days in a row right they're gonna have to build some tolerance to that before they can feel like they're actually gaining benefit because like i was saying before if they practice badly or practice a move flying around a problem area and they just get into those habits then it becomes a problem that has to really be spent some time on to correct that right. and really focused attention on that whereas if you're in a position where you feel like you benefit most from flying 10 flights a day um, and you structure those flights for individual tasks for example you might find that benefits you more but at the end of the day as long as you are still feeling connected with the model, just fly as much as you want, really. Right. If you start to lose focus and you start to find that you, you are making mistakes that you weren't making earlier on in your flight count that day, I would just stop for a bit. Not like stop, pack up for the whole day and go home. I would just say stop for 20 minutes, yeah. eat something, drink something, just do something out of that mindset for a short period probably longer than five minutes you know it needs to be a duration where your body can sort of calm down your heart rate changes your brain chemical will change um, and you're becoming in more of a relaxed condition so right. then when you go to fly again you should feel more naturally ready to take on new tasks and new information again you don't want to feel anxiety or high levels of anxiety when you're trying to improve right you want to be able to feel a relative calm and everything should flow. A higher rate of heart rate, sort of, for example, would be okay. But if you're 
you know, you're, you're shaking or yeah. you're sort of turning the transmitter as you fly or anything like that, that's a sign you're probably dealing with a, an area of, within the flying that you haven't spent enough time just specifically on that one task. Right. You're flying the manoeuvre kind of a bit too soon, if you know what I mean. Okay. Okay, so if, if we break that down in terms of the, your daily practice, how would you, what's an ideal way of breaking that down? So you definitely want to have that warm up sort of start, like I was saying before, you want to have a couple of flights, you know, this might depend on you as an individual, you might need five flights to get warmed up, some people might need one minute of flying till they feel ready to go and ready to, to practice. It depends on how much you practice really, and how used to giving yourself new tasks you're, you're doing. If you're the kind of person that has you know, flown for 10 years and you haven't seen any drastic improvement for a few years, you might find that you have to fly a few flights before you're ready to try something new. Right. Um, whereas somebody that's regularly practicing new maneuvers, they'll be ready much, much quicker normally, okay. just because they're used to that um, and their brain's more compatible with that. Um, there's a, a structure that we use within coaching, it's called TTPP, um, technical, tactical, psychological and physiological. So those are the sort of four key factors that you want to try to address when you're looking at dealing with a problem. So if you're structuring a day around improvement, it will be probably focused around one maneuver or one position or something along those kind of lines. So break down each of those four key points. So tactical, do I need to have uh, an escape plan in mind? Do I need to be able to um, fly at different heights to make that effect diff differently? If I fly in higher winds, does it make a difference? Does I fly in lower winds, does that make a difference? Right. So you're kind of thinking like tactically ahead of what's going to happen. Um, I'm already sure what I think should happen, but I'm, I'm ready to escape that if I need to by doing this. Right. So if you feel like you're practicing an inverted circuit or a figure of eight or something like that, um, or a funnel, something relatively smooth and consistent that isn't massively changing, unless the environment's causing the change, right. um, you're going to find that you can have a very tactical mindset. So if you're going downwind, you're going to have to think to yourself, right, I don't need to add as much pitch on the downwind. But then as you come round into the upwind, you're going to have to actually add some collective and push the model back Oops. up. Right. So before the cameras fell over. <laughs> Again. Again. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the, the tactical and technical side of things are things that you can do away from the flying field, potentially. There are things that you can research about. You can practice those on the sim a little bit before you actually come to the field. You want to understand the manoeuvre that you're trying to learn enough to be able to control that manoeuvre. So the technical and the tactical side of things are almost preemptive, if that makes sense. Um, and then the PP, um, physiological, is something that you do need to focus on. A lot of people think there's not much physical requirement from a pilot flying an RC heli in the field, but actually it's, it is quite an important factor that a lot of people don't think about. Right. So things like your food and caffeine intake, are you receptive to new stresses if you haven't drunk enough that day? Those kind of thing, okay. those small things will make a, a significant difference. If you hydrate properly, if you, you don't feel hungry at the field, you feel a fairly steady increase of energy throughout the day rather than having these peaks and troughs from where you, you're getting really hungry and I'm starting to snap at them, twitch at the sticks rather than flying the manoeuvre like you were when you were, you were better prepared physically. Right. Um, as well as, you know, just having... Um, mm, I'm just trying to think of the best way to describe that really, but just having an awareness of your body, really, right. and your mindset. If you feel like your mindset isn't prepared... Uh, to practice new manoeuvres. Don't push it necessarily, because that's when crashes sort of tend to happen. People are, are over anxiety and then they're, they're starting to snap. I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you, you started to fly a manoeuvre that you're more unfamiliar with and you get about halfway through it and you think, yes, yes, oh, hang on a minute, it's starting to go a bit out of shape and then you just go more, 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 and it just goes worse and worse and worse. Right. So that's a sign that those first three points, the TTP, they haven't been addressed well enough yet before you're actually practicing it at the field. Okay. Yeah? Does that kind of make sense? Very little. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take your word for it. Okay. Um, it is obviously a personal thing. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to see how, how you would actually relate that into something, well, something it's, that it's I'm working like on at the moment. It's basically like preparing your mind and body to learn 
rather than the actual bit where you're learning. Right. So the TTPP is about addressing all of the different areas and factors that come into place to gain new skill. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the psychological element, which is actually a huge part of RC Helis, I would say. Uh, and it's all going back to that point where I was talking to when people start turning the transmitter and changing the position they're standing in and all that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's just a sign that they're, they're not as comfortable as they should be to be able to fly a manoeuvre with any level of comfort. When you're trying a new manoeuvre, you don't want to be crashing every week yeah. or multiple times a week in some cases if you're, you're pushing that manoeuvre almost too soon. That's when you need to still work on those sort of more physical training elements that you can do at home on the sim safely so without worrying about crashing your expensive model. Um, so that when you're able to then get to the field, it's almost just like going through the motions. You're not actually feeling as stressed because you've done it a hundred times before. And right. You know what's going to happen to the model and I know roughly how to control it. But the fine tuning is then done at the field yeah. rather than on the sim. Right. Um, you just need to have the basics understanding of control on something like the sim. Um, and even if you're just hovering, it's the same all the way through to the most complicated 3D global type maneuvers. Um, but I would say the, the key factors for heli pilots are psychological. Out of those TTPP, it's, it's probably the most important right. one that we spend a lot of our time focusing on. I mean, that's, that's probably a great thing. You've got the blog going. You're going to have articles that you're going to be putting on there. And I imagine yeah. one of them is yeah. probably a good one, is, is the psychological side, as you yeah. say. OK, cool. Because that's, that's vast. You know, there's people that have written multiple books <laughs> about yeah. the dealing with psychological problems and how you overcome them right and as heli pilots i think you know we're dealing with a lot of fast pace maneuver potentially if you're flying 3d um and it's very stressful if you're not used to being in that environment whereas if you've flown that maneuver 50 times yeah. repetitively consistently on the sim well then it's time to go outside you don't need to sim that anymore you need to be outside flying at that right. point right. you just need the basic understanding and then you should be trying it and fine-tuning everything at the field rather than, than trying to perfect a manoeuvre on the sim. Yeah. This is where we can perfect. We want to perfect in the field. Yeah. So one of the things that comes up really, really often is about plateaus. People are always talking oh, yeah. about how they just hit these plateaus and it doesn't seem to progress and they go month after month and nothing changes. I mean, yeah. I, mean I guess there's so many different kinds of plateaus. But yeah, I think I guess we can what are the all agree. You would ask a pilot who was suffering with that, and what are the solutions? I think we can all agree that pretty much all pilots at some point have gone through a plateau, at least one each. Uh, you know, I, I remember going through one that I didn't feel like improved for a good solid year. It just felt like that it was just every time I went to the field, I'm doing the same thing, yeah. day after day after day. No matter how many flights I put in, no matter what I was changing, I just wasn't seeing any improvement until I started addressing things specifically. Um, before I started to see any real improvement again. Um, I think plateaus comes down to goal setting and things like that as well, potentially. So I think a lot of people, when they start flying, you know, they, they might aspire to being able to fly inverted. You know, that's like a dream. And like, oh, yeah, that'd be great, wouldn't it? That'd be wonderful. And then they start flying inverted and they get really comfortable with that. And then they go, ah, uh, yeah, I've kind of achieved that now. Yeah. I, I need the next bit and I need the next bit. But... I think it depends on how motivated you are as an individual as to how fast the process of progression will happen. Yeah. You'll still hit plateaus, but the plateaus you'll be able to get through quicker than somebody that isn't addressing those kind of weak areas. So quite often I will ask for feedback in my flying from someone like you, uh, somebody that flies not as good as me, for example. So I, I want to have feedback from lots of different opinions. Right. We call that external factors coming in. Um, and feedback and then once I've had a chance to evaluate that I then try and match that up with what I thought the flight was looking like do I agree do I disagree yeah. and it's good to have as many different opinions as possible but at some point you kind of go okay well I'm getting a general consensus from different people now I need to start measuring myself against what they're measuring me against and then yeah. once you can have that period of evaluation you then decide internally whether you need to address something or whether you should be looking to try something. So, so talk about, you mentioned TTPP earlier. 
Um, yeah. I didn't quite understand how it would work from a practical point of view, so maybe you can break it down and just say how you would attack it. Um, so more relatable each to one. heli stuff, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so if we if we just start with technical then. So the technical is the understanding of the manoeuvre. So we could use a set manoeuvre in a competition. So you can see the requirement there to sort of read the instructions and try and interpret the information as best as possible. Um, and then you've got to potentially discuss it with other pilots as well to fully understand what position the heli should be in at certain positions around the manoeuvre. Right. Um, so very technical focus, um, but it's not quite yet thinking ahead of the model. So we're not dealing with a flight right. type issue, we're dealing with a understanding type Yes, yeah, an understanding, issue. okay, I'm yeah. with you on that one. And then tactical is something you deal with in flight, definitely. So you're going to be uh, focusing on trying to be one step ahead of the model. So if it's a windy day, you want to be thinking about how much more collective you're going to add on the, the downwind versus the upwind sections. Right. Um, and you're, you're always trying to plan ahead of the model. And that's where the tactical side of things comes in because it's a preemptive maneuver yeah. or control measure that you would in to yeah. input to, to be able to make the maneuver look more symmetrical in its shape, okay. depending on conditions. And that is something you think about as you're walking out and you're looking at the evaluating the yeah. environment, or is it something yeah. you're actually, while you're in flight, you've got all this? All of the above. This, right, okay. Yeah, all of the above. So um, it's, it's something that you can think about watching other pilots. So if you're on a competition round, right. you could be sitting and watching others and going, oh, that section there is, is a bit of a tricky area for everyone today, so I need to work my attention span and think tactically how I'm going to be able to deal with that both on the ground, just watching, as well as flying the manoeuvre. Yeah. Uh, but you always try and think tactically in advance. That's what the tactical stuff is about. Okay. One step ahead. Right. Makes sense. Uh, so the physiological requirements are mostly just focused on about you understanding your own body and preparing your body for stress, if that makes sense. So um, if you're flying a manoeuvre that you're less comfortable with, you need to be in a position where you're able to push yourself but not push yourself to beyond breaking point so when you see pilots that are progressing um very quickly their their bodies and they've understood their bodies very quickly to be able to under to be able to determine what it could even be something as simple as a routine in the morning they're physically doing a certain routine right. every single day almost like a, a pre-flight kind of routine that you do on your model you're doing a pre-flight for yourself have I had enough to drink? Have I eaten enough? Have I had a good night's sleep? Am I in the right position? You know, all those kind of factors will play a role in that physical, physiological element. Yeah, I mean, is that very related? I mean, I can see a lot of that in competition, mm. but is that related? Does it have a value or does it have any impact on someone who's just, just flying? I think um, they, it, they want to get better. It will, but not as much as some of the other factors, I would right. say. It definitely plays a role. Uh, in competition, I would say it's, it's a, an important element you wouldn't want to overlook. Yeah. Um, but if you're thinking for just the average pilot trying to make a progressive step in their flying and move forward, then it's important that that person understands their mental capacity for new stuff. Right. Um, if you're trying to practice a new move on every flight and you're doing 20 flights a day and you've not done that kind of manoeuvring before, you're going to find that very taxing to the point in which you're going to start making errors unintentionally. Right. And then those errors are going to be harder for you to remove later. So it almost just being able to understand where that limit of comfort is. Yeah. And then there's a little stretch area but up beyond that where you can get a lot of learning done and a lot of new manoeuvre practice. But as soon as you reach critical point, you'll start snapping and, and doing weird things with your fingers and your brain starts to lose connection with your body. Right. And then it all starts to lose control of the model at that point until you can find that, that moment of recovery. Um, right. So it's, it's definitely an area to think about, but it's not as critical, I would say, for the average pilot. Just make sure you've eaten and drunk enough, you're in a fresh state, you know, you, you feel ready to learn. If right. you don't feel ready that day, don't push it, because you'll probably make more of an error, and then that'll be harder to get out later on. Right. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And then the, the second P? Um... Uh, psychological, which is probably the biggest element for heli pilots. Um, learning to deal with stress and anxiety is what that sort of comes down to. So 
if you're in a position where you lack confidence, if you're in a position where you uh, you have like performance anxiety type issues, so if you're in a, a public area and there's a lot of people watching you, does that make you fly differently to what you would if you were on your own? Yeah. Um, and then trying to address those areas, it's it's just like a manoeuvre. You need to address the weaknesses in that, otherwise they become harder and harder to deal with down the line. Right. So for the average kind of pilot that's wanting to take the next move or the next couple of moves in their flying, um, they're going to have to really address weaknesses in their flying ability to be able to build enough confidence to feel like I can take that manoeuvre anywhere, in any conditions, with any background of people or whatever, and feel comfortable. Right. And that almost becomes like a practical step then into doing the different drills or different training methods that you go through to build enough headspace yeah. to build confidence and happiness level. Yeah. But think of the psychological element of, as I call it headspace. How much headspace have you got to progress? If you're reaching that pinnacle peak where everything sort of drops off suddenly, it's a really good position to be in just before that to right. gain a lot of stress and anxiety. And the more time you spend in that area, it will expand and get bigger. Yeah. Um, but the more time you spend there, the more time your body gets used to that, um, and the more you'll find that the progression starts to come more naturally. Okay. But you don't want to get to the point where you suddenly hit that peak and you drop off, because then it's like starting all over again. Right. You've got to then build that confidence back up. So let's say a simple maneuver for, for us would be like a, a circuit. If you are got any weaknesses in that circuit and as, as a beginner, you're going to get to that corner and you're going to try and rush that corner as quickly as possible to right. be able to get into that happy place again. And that's probably not a, anything else to do with the other TTP, but that one psychological area is causing such an anxiety, yeah. you can't get through that without rushing it. Right. Um, so focused attention and practice of that individual area will make a huge difference. Okay. So that sort of brings me on to another thing, which is choking or in a competition or having anxiety in a competition where just performance seems to just go out of the window. I've been in competitions where I've seen two or three people literally fall apart. Okay, mm. I say literally, but yeah, yeah. figurative man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> so, so I've seen pilots figuratively fall apart. Um, and, and, and flights that they were doing yesterday in, a, in an amazing way, yeah. now in front of the judges, just, just collapses. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, my, sort of my job as a coach in the past when I've been dealing with competitive athletes, it's my, my responsibility is to try to get those students to peak at the perfect opportunity in their practice so that the competition just feels like another day at the office. Right. You know, it shouldn't feel like you get to that point and you're at the competition, this is their moment. They've actually been waiting to release. That's what they wanted to be able to do. Whereas if you're in a situation where you've built so much pressure on yourself, you get to the point of that drop off again. So it's almost like that person hasn't had enough stress training, <laughs> if that makes sense. So right. if you feel like that's an issue for you, I would say you need to get used to flying in front of people as yeah. much as possible um, and actually get people to judge you standing next to you. Yeah. So almost like an examiner's kind of point of view. Yeah. So you're going to have somebody right sitting on your shoulder and you're going to push their their stress and their workload psychologically. Yeah, and, it and doesn't the more even time they be... do that, the more headspace they're going to gain. And it doesn't have to even be in a competition state. Yeah. No, no. I mean, literally 15 minutes ago, we were out there. You were going to show me a manoeuvre that yeah. you'd been done doing perfectly. Yeah. And it just it started to wonder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, For sure. But and, it's, it's... and that's certainly a way of measuring where you are in a manoeuvre as well. I found yeah. in the past is you think you can do something incredibly well. You get someone standing next to you judging you and it yeah. just falls apart. And yeah. that means you've got another step to go. You've yeah, if anything, level. it's almost like taking a step back before yeah. you can step forward again. Right. Um, because you might be able to fly exactly the way you, you hope and you dream on your own, but when you bring it to the community of people, of peers that you, tr you respect and you, you like their, you know, their positive feedback, then as soon as you hear something negatively interpreted to you, it's almost like you, you kind of, have you got smaller? Or am I not as good a pilot as I was before? You, know, you put a lot of doubt in your mind. Yeah. And it's a very personal thing. Some people, um, can brush that kind of stuff off quite quickly. 
Um, some people need to spend a good amount of time just sitting on their own thinking about it. Other people, you'll find that they need to, like, they just need to go flying immediately. Yeah. I've, I've, I've heard that, right, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to smash it. I'm going to do 20 flights and just sort that problem out and then it's gone and then I feel happy with it again and get that reassurance at the end of those 20 flights going, what do you think now, Rich? They're looking good now, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of approaching that psychological area of the TTPP. Right. So if, if it's probably one of the largest problem areas we have as, as performance type pilots or progressing pilots. Right, right. I think so, a couple of years ago when I contacted you about my, the, what I was doing to improve, um, I asked you about videos. Should I be watching videos? And I thought your answer would be, you're better off doing sim. Just forget the videos. I'm, and, and you actually said the opposite. You said videos, you said to me, videos are actually immensely helpful. They show you what the model can do. They show you what pilots are being able to do. And they show you orientations uh, that you don't see in your own flying. Yeah, yeah. And it, it opens up. I mean, do you still feel that way, that it just opens up? Yeah, I do. I, do, I don't think it's a... Well, there could be a negative out of watching certain videos, um, depending on what it is that you're trying to, to gain from that information. So if you approach video watching with like a, a, like a training method rather than just freely watching videos, if you just sort of freely watch videos, it, it's more sort of like keeping your motivation up. You know, oh yeah, I like that, I like that, really cool. Um, but if you want to use a video proactively to help you progress, then you're looking to see flights from people that you wouldn't normally see. So if you're more of a left rudder person, I want to watch somebody like Nick Maxwell, who's slightly more right rudder orientated. And then you'll start to see orientation methods that you're just less familiar with yeah. on an average flying day. If you don't fly with people that fly right rudder, seeing that as often as you can and just going through the motions of seeing those positions and orientations will expand the mind enough yeah. to have more headspace when you start trying to do more right rudder stuff. Yeah, because effectively you're familiarising yourself with things that just you don't see on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. Could you, if you imagine yourself being completely on your own as an isolated pilot in the middle of nowhere and you had to suddenly learn how to do right rudder and you'd spent all your time left rudder, it's like starting again. Yeah. You know, it's like that totally fresh start. Whereas if you can spend time with people that are doing a different orientation or a different way of flying, yeah. it, it opens up a lot of headspace for you to start thinking about how I can include that in a, in a routine or how I can include that in just a, an average day of flying for you. Right. Um, I think it's important to watch video, but it's also worth remembering what the process has gone in for the person that's made that video they could have put that video as being a, like a pinnacle moment of that entire month of training that they've done. It's not necessarily gonna represent the average flight. So right. don't over compare yourself yeah. to that. Um, in, quite often we're watching world-class pilots, aren't we, when we're doing that kind of thing. So yeah. if, if you're considering watching videos to help you learn, try and watch the pilots that are doing things differently to what you would normally see right. for you because that expands your your ability to take on new stuff yeah if that makes yeah. sense yeah yeah 100 percent, absolutely yeah you've got this blog that you do on facebook rc heli performance yep. so you're going to be doing articles on this kind of stuff well probably yeah it'll either be in some sort of written format or audio uh listening kind of type thing but um i'm always open to questions i i do get asked quite often from pilots how they should be practicing what they should be doing just in conversation so if people have got that sort of interest they can just get in touch and, okay. and ask those kind of simple questions and cool. I you know I can even include that in some of the content potentially but it's it's an area that I think pilots really need to focus uh, in on if they want to improve um, and that that all starts with the pilot internally on that motivation yeah. so if you're motivated to learn but you don't know how I can sort of give you some opportunity to work out how the best way for you is probably going to be. Yeah. Um, so I can help with that. As I said, I think in one of the uh, earlier on is that I contacted you because you can go to a, a performance coach and a, and a, a performance p a person and they can, they can talk to you about in gen, in generals, but they can't talk to you about the, the, yeah, the specifics of heli. So I can yeah, ask yeah. them what a pyro TikTok <laughs> is and I'm really struggling yeah, with it. Yeah, and they're yeah, going to yeah. go, well, yeah. 
you can make a goal that, that yeah. means nothing. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. really useful being able to talk to someone who actually has an understanding of the difficulties of flying helis. Yeah, and, and you know, I'd, you I'd love through. to be stretched by the machines as much as any pilot. You know, I'd love to challenge. So it's, it's one of those things where I, I, I firmly believe that it's, it's good for me in my professional development to come back and do things like this because it forces me to keep expanding my mind Yeah, all you the get time. to reevaluate things that you've maybe already evaluated yeah. and have a fixed view on it. But. And it helps me learn how to teach better because yeah. I'm forcing myself to learn new things all the time. Yeah. And I have to remind myself of what that can feel like for my students yeah. um, that I coach. So it's, 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 yeah, it's very enlightening. The hobby's been a great opportunity for that. Okay. So. Cool. Well, I guess we'll keep an eye out on the blog and... Um... Yeah. But yeah, just get in touch if you've got any questions. Thanks, dude. No problem. Thanks very much. I think that's it. Cool. Let's go fly. Yar!